Hi everybody and welcome to another video. While we're in lockdown, we can't gather together as a church, but we are meeting together uh, across the internet and um, over CDs and having a chance still to be together, to worship Jesus together, to hear from his word. So I'm really glad you're able to join me for this. I've got my cuppa, I've got my Bible. Today we're beginning a series in Mark's Gospel. I don't really know how long it's going to take us. Um, it certainly will take us a while and we're going to have breaks now and again to think about some different stuff and we'll have guest speakers and so on. But my confidence is that as we take some real time to dig in and explore this gospel together, we're going to be strengthened in our faith. We're going to learn so much more about the Lord Jesus. Our confidence in the gospel and our love for God is going to grow. And that's my prayer as we begin this time. So we're not going to rush it. Um, we're going to have a good time just getting to know this gospel really well. For those of us who have followed Jesus for a while, uh, you might think, really, again, back to basics? Well, yes. They'll certainly be reminded of some basics, but actually I want us to see that that far from being uh, something that we get to know and then move on from and graduate from, the gospel is everything that our faith is about. And so, yes, we'll be reminded of some basics, but also we're going to be pushed on on what we believe and why and, and what it truly means for us to follow Jesus. And for new Christians, I pray this is going to be an amazing opportunity for you to keep discovering, to be grounded in the truth of Jesus, for that foundation to keep getting firmed up, to know more deeply the one around whom everything centres. And for any who don't follow Jesus yet, maybe you're intrigued but you don't want to commit or you're sceptical uh, and looking for evidence you need convincing or uh, you just couldn't care less but you end up hearing this somehow anyway, well, my challenge is that if you take the time to meet the Jesus that Mark shows us in his book, well, you may be offended sometimes or challenged. You'll certainly be surprised. But I think there you're going to find there is nothing boring or irrelevant about Jesus and that he offers the solutions to your deepest needs. So that's what we're doing here in this sermon, uh, an introduction to the Gospel of Mark. And then next week we'll dig in proper to the first set of verses there. So today we're just going to ask four questions to orientate ourselves, and, and they're these. Who was Mark? Why did Mark write his gospel? Why should we trust it? And why should we care? There are four questions. Who was he? Why did he write it? Why should we trust it? Why should we care? So let's have our Bibles open. We're going to see how Mark begins his book this morning. We're interested in the claims of verse 1. But let's read the first three verses together. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. So Lord, as we take the time to consider these questions this morning and the claims that Mark makes in the first verse of his gospel, I pray, Lord, you would open our hearts now, wherever we're at, whoever we are, whatever our uh, status before Jesus, we ask that you would work in our hearts through this time, through your word. Grow us uh, in, in our knowledge, grow us in confidence in your, in your gospels. And grow us in love for Jesus Christ, we pray. Do this work in us, we ask. In his name, for your sake. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I don't know if you're a bit like me in this. Probably not, I suspect. But when I read a book, or especially when I watch a film, what I actually want to know is all about the person who made that work. It might be a bit crazy, but if I've got a film on, I have uh, the, the app, the Internet Movie Database, sat uh, very close to me. And for an hour afterwards, even, I could just be reading up as much as I can about, about the film. Who wrote it? Who directed it? Why did they cast particular people in particular roles? Who edited it and composed the music? I read into the director and make a list of their other films so that I can watch those too. Why am I like this? Well... I've got no idea, to be honest, but Rach would say it's just that I'm a bit odd. Um, but I think one good reason um, is, is this, at least. I'm going to argue it anyway. A good film doesn't just exist or come into being on its own. It doesn't just arrive fully formed. The fingerprints of its creators will be all over it. 
They have a story to tell, they have a statement to make, they have a reason for creating that piece of art. And so as I watch that, I, I wanna understand the people who made it to have a better grasp of why it was they made it and what it is they're trying to say. And the same is true when it comes to the Bible. In fact, it's so much more important when we come to the Bible. We know that the Bible is God's word, that he is its divine author, but the writings that make up our Bibles had many human authors. God didn't just put them in a trance and zap words directly into their brain and then they wrote them like automatic writing, no. The Bible's individual authors had their own personalities and interests. They had their own writing styles and vocabulary. Their writing reflects the time and the culture in which they lived. And so as we prepare to explore his book, it's worth us asking our first question. Who was Mark? What can we know about him? Well, confusingly, perhaps to start, his name was John Mark. As was common in his day, he had a Hebrew name, John, which his family would have used, it was his familiar name. And he had a Greek name, Mark, that we know, and, and he would have used that in his professional dealings. He grew up in a good home in Jerusalem, probably to a, a reasonably well-off family. His mum was called Mary, and she also became a follower of Jesus. You can read in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, how Mark's mum's house was used as a meeting place for the early Christians. They gathered there to pray. Where else do we see John Mark? Well, we see in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, that John Mark had a cousin called Barnabas. Now, when Barnabas and the Apostle Paul travelled to share the gospel in Cyprus, you can read about that in Acts 13, Mark joined them. So he went on some missionary journeys with Paul and with Barnabas. He returned to Jerusalem, possibly because he'd let Paul down in some way. And so later he went out to Cyprus again, but just with Barnabas. But whatever problem there might have been between our, our man Mark and Paul, well, it was fixed. They resolved it. As we see, uh, Paul describes Mark as useful to me for my ministry in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and as a fellow worker in Philemon 24. So although Mark's name doesn't appear anywhere in his gospel, there's no dispute that he is the one who wrote it and that Jesus' closest disciple, Simon Peter, is the main source for Mark's information. So Mark has this uh, steady flow of information right from uh, Jesus' closest friend, Peter. Did Mark meet Jesus himself? Well, possibly, possibly not. We don't know for sure, but like all the best film directors give themselves little cameos in their movies, they show up in the background of a shot or they give themselves a line of dialogue. So it's likely Mark did uh, give himself a sneaky cameo in his gospel. In chapter 14, when Jesus is arrested uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the scene turns chaotic and all the disciples flee. But Mark writes this little detail that I've always found a bit amusing. Everyone else left Jesus, but in verse 51 he says... A young man did follow him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they, that's the soldiers, seized him. But he left the linen cloth and he ran away naked. Who was this naked fellow, uh, this mysterious man uh, who was there in the garden as Jesus was arrested? It was probably, people believe, John Mark. So we have a bit of a sense of who Mark is. Apart from going out uh, inappropriately dressed, we know his relatives, we know where he lived, we know where he grew up, uh, we know who his sources were. So that leads us to our second question then. Why did Mark write this book? Why did he write the gospel? I believe the answer is right there in verse 1. Mark wrote the gospel that we might be introduced to the person of Jesus. Jesus is his reason for writing. We call it a gospel uh, but that's not what Mark called it. When he says in verse 1, this is the beginning of the gospel, he's simply saying, this is the start of my book of good news. That's all gospel means, good news. It's the good news of Jesus who is the subject and the substance of this short book. We could describe Mark's book as an ancient biography. Now, I've read a couple of biographies in the last month or two, uh, and they usually take this standard approach. You've got a famous person, you find out about their birth, their family, their childhood, their education, their work, and in some cases, their death. But ancient biographies were a little different 
from modern biographies that, that we might read today. They were never about just ordinary people. They only focused in on key successes of a famous person's life. They often exaggerated those successes and they skipped over all the irrelevant details. They rarely described the kind of things that we're quite interested in today, what a person looked like, how they dressed or, or how they felt. And so they can read in quite dry ways. But often the stories weren't in order either. They were intentionally structured to make a point. So you might not have got someone's life uh, from birth to death in that order. And usually, of course, it was about how brilliant a person was. It was all about bigging them up. And so Mark's gospel, in some ways, fits into that picture of an ancient biography. It does just focus on a few events. Mark doesn't tell us about everything in the exact order that it happened in Jesus' life. Mark doesn't tell us everything that Jesus did. He only mentions events from the last three years of Jesus' life. And out of the 16 chapters in his gospel, six of them focus on Jesus' final week. So this really helps us to zoom in on what Mark feels is the most important thing for us to know, the key to his message. He misses out loads of stuff. Compared to the other three Gospels, his is the shortest. He doesn't tell us anything about Jesus' birth or childhood or how Jesus looked or his fashion sense or his hobbies and interests. He dives straight in to the start of Jesus' ministry. And so in one sense, Mark is like this kind of ancient biography. But it's also quite different because this isn't a story of a widely revered war hero or politician. It's the story of a simple rabbi who taught with some authority. I guess a peasant man uh, who, had, who had been a refugee who, who claimed to be God. A devout Jew who turned the religious system of his day upside down even as he claimed to be God's representative. A man who had power over sin and sickness and death. More than a prophet, a, a God-man who rose from the dead. A man whose followers believe that he was God's immortal king, the fulfilment of all God's promises, and so worship him as divine. These are the claims that Mark believed to be true. And this isn't just information processed and passed along like a normal ancient biography. Mark wants his readers to respond to Jesus. He wants us to feel, to be emotionally engaged with the story. And so he tells us a lot about how Jesus and those who encountered him felt. There's a lot of emotion in Mark's gospel. There's compassion and fear and gratitude and love and anger and grief. And perhaps the biggest difference between Mark's story of Jesus and an ancient biography is this. After starting strong, introducing Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, the Lord, the healer, the teacher, the one with authority, things begin to unravel a bit. You see, this Jesus is mocked and ignored and despised. He's rejected by his family. He's insulted and kicked out of town. He identifies with the outcast and the poor, the humble. He challenges the rich and the religious. He makes an enemy of the religious leaders and they try and trick him and test him and then they kill him. Yes, Mark says he's God's king and yet he came to suffer and to die. This is no ordinary biography. This is no ordinary man. And so it demands a response if this is true, our lives can't remain the same as we spend time in Mark's gospel. It's not just for information, it's for response. What about how Mark shapes his book? He didn't just write his favourite stories down as they came to memory, like a, like a diary. Rather, it was more like he's an architect designing a new building. Mark carefully plans and structures his book. And we can break that structure down into roughly three big sections. The first section is the first eight and a half chapters. They begin with a little prologue, um, but then Mark basically asks, who is this Jesus? And he spends these first eight and a half chapters answering that question by showing us what Jesus said and what Jesus did. Those two things together, what he said and what he did, are meant to paint a portrait for us of the Messiah, 
to prove Mark's claim in verse 1 that Jesus is the Son of God. But in these first eight chapters, neither Jesus' enemies nor his friends really grasp who he is. Rather, they're scared of him. They're scared of what they see him do and his authority. They lack faith and they're suspicious. So all of these first eight chapters or so are set in Galilee, the backwaters, the part of the old northern kingdom of Israel. As Mark moves on, uh, the middle of chapter 8 then through to chapter 11, there comes this growing realisation of who Jesus really is. Jesus begins to explain more about why he's come, that he's come to suffer and to die and to rise again. And he teaches about what it is going to mean to belong to the kingdom where he is king. And all of this happens as they set off from Galilee on this long walk south towards Jerusalem, the holy city, the capital. And then from chapter 11 through to the end uh, of the gospel, chapter 16, they all take place in Jerusalem. He's arrived. The king enters the holy city. It's the final reckoning. Jesus seeks out direct conflict with the old religious system. He judges it for its fruitlessness. He judges its leaders for their hypocrisy. He predicts the end of worship centred in Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and so he is marked for death. Finally, he is betrayed and abandoned and put on trial and crucified and buried. But that is not the end because chapter 16 brings this gospel full circle. Jesus rises from the dead and heads back to Galilee. So all of this we're asking, why did Mark write his gospel? Israel, just like many other cultures at the time, was one of oral tradition. It was a time when most couldn't read or write and so the teachings and events of Jesus' life, they had been witnessed and they had been carefully told and memorised and retold. And so, 30 years after Jesus' death, why did Mark decide to gather these established stories and put pen to parchment? Well, it wasn't merely to tell this interesting story but it was to confront his readers, to say the first generation of people who met Jesus, we're dying out, but this is important. It needs to continue. You need to be able to respond to Jesus. This is the Jesus who we Christians worship, Mark is saying. What do you make of him? Will you worship him too? If so, then like Jesus, you're gonna be called to follow at a great cost to take up the cross, to lose your life for the sake of the gospel. It's a book written to set the record straight for the next generation. Here's Jesus, here's what it means to follow him. Will you take up the challenge? And so it's not just for those who come after Mark uh, in the next generation there, but for every next generation and for us today. If Mark's call is to a radical change of life, to a faith that costs as you walk in the footsteps of a suffering saviour. Well, that's a big deal. He's making big claims and he's holding out a big challenge. It's life-changing stuff. And that is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for his culture, uh, just as it's uncomfortable for those who hear it in our culture. If you're not a Christian and you're listening to this, or you are a Christian who has ever sat down with a skeptic to talk about this stuff, you'll have have held or heard this thought, this accusation. You can't trust what you read in the Gospels. How can you be sure that these ancient writings from 2,000 years ago nearly haven't been manipulated or corrupted? Put another way, the question is this. Can we trust Mark's Gospel and the other Gospels for that matter? Are they accurate? Couldn't they have been accidentally or purposefully changed? Even if Mark had the best intentions in mind, even if he really believed what he wrote down, how do we know that it hasn't been changed since then? And this is a great question. It's especially important because as we've seen, the claims Mark makes about Jesus will have an impact on our lives if we choose to believe them. We need to be sure that this is reliable. And so that brings us to our third point. Why should we trust Mark's gospel? Why should we trust it? Let's think about it this way. Maybe you know of Julius Caesar. None of us would argue that Julius Caesar didn't exist. 
He was born about a hundred years before Jesus, and there are sculptures and coins with his likeness on them. No one would say Julius Caesar didn't exist. But how do we know what's true about him? Well, we look to what is written down. And historians will happily teach with confidence about the events of Caesar's life from the writings that we have about him. We believe Caesar himself wrote stuff down. And then some of his contemporaries who lived at the same time as him wrote things down about him. And then some ancient biographers wrote about him, although they didn't write anything down about him until over a hundred years after his death. Yet our historians today don't have any of those original documents that were written. Rather, they rely on copies. All in all, there are about 60 manuscripts that we can use to build a picture of who Julius Caesar was and his life. But get this, all of these manuscripts that we have to tell us about Caesar, they all date between 500 and 1200 years after Caesar was alive. We don't have anything earlier. In other words, there's a silence of 500 years before the first documents that we have that we can rely on to find out about Julius Caesar. Now we believe, and this is just standard in, 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 in the world of, of his, historians, we believe that they give us enough evidence that we can piece together a portrait of who Caesar was, what he wrote, what he said, what he did. Why this history lesson? Why are we going on about this? Because I want to show us how confident now we can be about the Gospels that we're coming to. How much we can trust Mark as a faithful communicator about Jesus. See, most of us know there are four main writings about Jesus' life. Four documents. And they're gathered in our New Testaments. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Now, Matthew and John, they knew Jesus personally. Luke... Uh, knew Paul and so he interviewed Paul and loads of other eyewitnesses in order to write his story of Jesus and the main source for Mark our author as as we've already mentioned was Jesus closest disciple Peter now all four gospels were written within about 30 to 50 years after Jesus death so really close to the events much closer than the historians who wrote about Julius Caesar and people who knew Jesus, who met him, who loved him, who hated him, who knew his disciples, loads of them would have still been alive when these Gospels were written to speak up if the writers were telling lies. They'd be able to say, no, I was there and it wasn't like that. I met Jesus. I heard him speak. He never said that. I was in the room when this happened. That miracle didn't occur. So this is really important. Mark writes his Gospel at a time when people could say, Mark, that's just not true. But there's no evidence that that's the case. Now, like with Caesar, we don't have any of those original manuscripts. Again, that's no surprise. They're nearly 2,000 years old. They're long gone. We saw that the closest copies we have of any writing to do with Caesar were from between 500 and 1,200 years after his death. But what about the Gospels? Well, this is amazing. There are fragments of John's Gospel uh, as, as written as close as 90 years after Jesus' death. And that's just 30 to 50 years after John wrote his Gospel. And we have full copies of all four Gospels within 400 years of Jesus' death. Today, we know of over 5,800 manuscripts from those first 1,400 years after Jesus died and rose again. 5,800. Compare that to the 60 that we use to learn about Julius Caesar. The point is this. The Gospels were written really close to the events of Jesus' life. They were written by people who knew him. They were scrutinised by people who were there. They weren't refuted by people who were there who could say that didn't happen or it wasn't like that. No, people agreed that these were true. And after they were written, they were copied because, of course, this news was written to be spread, to be distributed. And they were copied with amazing accuracy. On top of that, the next generations of Christians wrote letters and documents and sermons that quoted from these Gospels. So we have loads of secondary sources, they're called extra documents, that quote the Gospels. So we know that, that what is quoted was what was written originally. 
And these were spread not just in one place, but across Africa and Europe and the Middle East. They were written in different languages, and yet the quotes match up. And so despite being so spread out, it all fits together. It all supports the evidence that the Gospels we have today were the same Gospels that were written and distributed in those first years after Mark, Matthew, Luke and John wrote them. All of these Gospels were copied and translated accurately and they were distributed within no time at all. And more than that even, there were both Jewish and Greek historians who wrote down many facts about Jesus and the early church. They had no desire at all to support the claims of Jesus' followers. In fact, some of them were writing what they did to outright mock them. But what they've inadvertently done is given proof of, of, of Jesus' existence, his life and the early life of the church. They didn't deny the gospel accounts. They didn't claim that Jesus didn't exist. In fact, they attest to his miracles, his teaching. They, they prove that he was worshipped and that he was crucified. All these authors did was look for other ways to explain the amazing events in Jesus' life. Look, I know that's a lot of stuff there. I hope it's kind of interesting to some of you. Don't worry if it doesn't all click. The point is this. This is what I want us to see. We can be completely confident that when we open our Bible to Mark's Gospel, what we are reading is what Mark wrote. And what Mark wrote matches tr truthfully with what eyewitnesses saw and what Peter knew and preached. And what Peter knew and preached was the truth about the life, the words, the miracles, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This matters because as a document declaring truth, it has stood the test of time for nearly 2000 years. We must take it seriously precisely because it hasn't just faded away into obscurity or become an interesting document from antiquity. This is trustworthy stuff that changes lives today. And so that leads us on to the last thing, the fourth thing. Why should we care about all this? We've asked who was Mark? Why did he write his gospel? How can we trust it? But it does all come down to this, doesn't it? Why should we care? What difference is this going to make to our lives, to our faith, to our walk with God? When life sucks, when it's hard, when we're in pain, when we're doubting, or when we're riding high, when things are going well. In the ordinariness of life, when the kids are hard work, when we're struggling with the busyness of things, how can Mark's gospel make a difference in our lives? As we close, here are two quick reasons that I want to give us why we should care. Firstly, because Mark tells us it's good news. We should care because that claim in the first sentence that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the promised one. We should care because he promises us that this is good news. The gospel of Jesus transformed his life. It transformed his family's life. We live in a time where, if we choose, we can really get weighed down by a constant stream of bad news. I think it's a bad habit, certainly one that I have. Almost an addiction for some of us, isn't it? Lots of us find at the moment we're just checking the news all the time, compulsively, more than we ever used to. It's like a reflex action. You pick up the phone, you flick to the news website. The constantly evolving situations in our world drive us to our phones and TVs to keep up. And that in turn drives us crazy because it's almost always bad news. Bad news shifts units, doesn't it? It makes money. Good news does not. But we need good news. We need some hope to hold on to. We need to have certainty that the future offers something better. And the newspapers will rarely ever give us that. Even when there are glimmers of good news, a vaccine, a trade deal, a success story, we know these things don't really bring change that would last into eternity. But Mark saw whole communities transformed by this good news. He saw the power of the gospel to bring healing, wholeness, salvation. As he journeyed with Paul and Barnabas, he traveled alongside Peter. He saw the risen Jesus working in the power of the Holy Spirit to start a movement from 12 scared dudes in an upstairs room to a new era 
Uh, the church of God, broken people saved by grace as they put their faith in this divine Messiah, the one who fulfills all the promises of God. And so the good news that Mark holds out is, is, is a person, a person that we can know and trust and rely on and follow and believe in, a person who is not dead an interesting person from the past, but a person who is alive, who was no mere man, but God himself, the divine king who became a human being and entered into the human experience in order to rescue humanity from slavery to sin and death. The fulfillment and the answer to all the promises of God was found in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one promised to Israel through history as a saviour and a deliverer for the whole world. And so as we take our time walking through Mark's gospel together as a church, we're going to be uplifted with good news, the good news of who Jesus is and what he came to do. And that leads us on to the second reason we should care, because Mark's gospel speaks to our needs today. It may be a 2000 year old document from the Middle East uh, written by some guy who's long gone, but it isn't an irrelevant document only of interest to historians. It is completely relevant to our needs today. Let me ask some questions. Are you overcome by fear? Or are you outcast? Are you ignored and rejected? Do you feel like you lack purpose in life? Do you doubt? Do you struggle with the evil inclinations in your heart? Perhaps you need freedom from spiritual or material or ideological powers that oppress you and crush you and weigh you down. Doesn't this world need a trustworthy authority that speaks love to hate? that speaks justice to corruption, that speaks truth to lies? Do you need a saviour who isn't self-serving, but self-giving? Who doesn't punish sinners, but takes the punishment on their behalf? Who forgives and sets free? Who doesn't condemn us, but offers us grace? If there's a God, don't we need to know that his promises are sure and trustworthy? And if our relationship with God is broken, don't we need a way that that can be restored, that we can be in a good, right relationship with him? Well, if our answer to any of those questions is yes, well, then we're not alone. Jesus came to still our deepest fears and to meet our deepest needs. As he says in Mark 2 verse 17, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Man, this is good news for those of us who know our desperate situation before God, who know that we are overcome by sin, that we need a saviour. Mark knew the whole world needs this good news. Mark was one of the first, if not the first, to write down this gospel of Jesus. And God, in his kindness and sovereignty, has preserved it as a part of scripture, down through the ages, against all the odds, so that Jesus can meet our deepest needs today. Consider the evidence we've heard. The Gospel of Mark is reliable. We know who wrote it. It was written with integrity. Mark used first-hand eyewitness accounts. The book has the power to change lives. It has done so throughout 2,000 years of history. It answers the most important fundamental questions that any man or woman and child could possibly ask. Can I know God? Who was Jesus? Why did he come? How can I know him? We're going to have a good time in Mark's gospel over this time. So dig in. Let's get stuck in. Let's commit to meeting Jesus in the pages of this book. Let's do it together that our church may grow and benefit, that we might know and love Jesus more. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you so much that you inspired Mark to write this book. We thank you, Lord, that, that as we've seen, it is trustworthy. You have preserved it throughout history. That what we read in our Bibles today, those words that Mark first wrote, tell us truths that, that can be relied on. Lord, we thank you that Mark shows us 
Jesus. We thank you that he was bold to commit to write down not just the easy things, but the hard things. That he showed us not just the successes of the lives of the disciples, but their failures too. That he showed us the difficult things about following Jesus as well as the glory of following Jesus. And that he didn't lie and pretend and paint Jesus uh, in any other way than how he was. We thank you that he didn't hide the fact that Jesus was rejected, ignored, despised, crucified. We thank you that he showed the reality of what Jesus went through and the reality of what we will go through as we follow him. We thank you that Mark laid down a challenge that was not just for his generation and then one to follow, but is absolutely relevant to us. Lord, maybe at the end of all this we think, ah, oh, why are we going over the basics again? Lord, I pray you would humble us if we think that. Lord, that you would show us um, new and deep insights as we travel through Mark's gospel. Lord, that our foundations would be strengthened, that we would cling ever closer to the person of Jesus, that we would rejoice again in the riches of the gospel, that we would see that the gospel isn't something that we just understand and then move on to something deeper, but the gospel is the depth that we can continue to mine into it, discover more about who Jesus was, who you are, how we can live in the light of these truths. So please, Lord, humble us before your word. Help us, we pray, as we move forward. Lord, we want to be a church that is uh, founded on the glory of the gospel, that relies only on the good news of Jesus, who he was and what he did. We want to be a church that looks only to him and no other. That we might glorify you and that we might take this good news out to a world in need. To a world desperate for hope. To those in great need of salvation. That they might come to meet and know this Jesus too. To help us we pray, be with us as we go ahead. For your glory and for your sake in your church we pray. Amen. Well, I realise there's a, a lot going on there. Thank you for sticking with me. And um, I, again, I really hope that, that what you've heard this morning, uh, some of it will have challenged you. Some of it perhaps you heard for the first time. Some of it maybe I, I need to go into more depth about. You've got questions. You want to find out more. Are there articles or books you can read to discover? Uh, so please get in touch. Get in touch with me personally on Facebook or WhatsApp or, or give me a buzz uh, or, or leave a message in one of our groups so that others can see your questions and, and have them answered too. There is so much uh, that we can explore together. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Please be in touch. I'm praying for you. The leaders are praying for you. Uh, and we'd love to hear how you're getting on. Uh, so please, let's keep communicating. Let's keep supporting one another. Let's keep being the church that we are called to be. God bless you. Take care.